land banking can be the thing that completely sends your portfolio to another level. You're going to get a hockey stick return if you understand what you're buying and where you're buying it. Rob Flux, developer and head of the Property Developer Network, Australia's largest community of property developers, breaks down the key factors you need to consider as a property investor when you're land banking to make some serious profits. We actually want the deal to not be profitable right now. You're putting a little bit of effort into making sure it's the right product and then the right product will make a lot of sense. The wrong product will do nothing. Two, two key words. If you're serious about growing the equity in your portfolio, but maybe you don't want to go through with a whole development yourself, land banking could be for you. My name is Todd Sloan. This is the Pizza and Property Podcast, and you're listening to my chat with Rob Flux. Rob Flux, back again, mate. How are you? Mate, I'm loving it. I'm doing great, mate. Uh, getting over a little bit of sickness, but I'm at the tail end of that. Good, good. Well, it's good to have you on and uh, all happy and healthy. We're going to be talking about supercharging some profits within your portfolio, more so the growth of your portfolio. By doing something that to some people is counterintuitive to growth. I really wanted to unpack your take on this, though, because it sounds like it might be at the start, but land banking can be the thing that actually just completely sends your portfolio to another level later on. Correct. You can get, you're going to get a hockey stick return if you understand what you're buying and where you're buying it. Now, and I know we're going through the, the where side of things, also the types of investors. We've got a little bit to cover in this and being a slice, time is not on our side quite the same way. But is there anything you want to set the stage with before we get into all this, mate? Yeah, absolutely. So there's three different kinds of investors. So there's, I guess, your typical investor with a long-term buy and hold approach. Mm -hmm. There's your developer with a more active approach where they're putting a lot of sweat equity into the process. Mm -hmm. And the land banker is the one in the middle, which is a semi-passive. So you're putting a little bit of effort into making sure it's the right product and then wait a long time. And later on, you can then force the value on through the, the development process. Okay, so it's a bit more than being completely passive, but not as much as like full-on developing. You're letting the, the, the long passive hold create some equity that you can choose to tap into later on and turn one key into many keys. Now, before we get into the three different sections of this that people really need to fully understand, I know that you really wanted to talk about where, because just doing it doesn't make the difference. It's where you do it that makes all the difference as well. So understanding where there's going to be growth and why the growth is actually going to happen. So there's a uh, every single state government plans for 20 and 30 years in advance where they're going to push population to actually go. Mm -hmm. So if you understand where the strategic plans are actually going to push people, the density may not be today, but eventually it's going to grow into that space. So you might be able to pick up something cheap today because mm -hmm. there's not much demand today, but in five years, 10 years, 15 years, as the density grows, as population moves towards that, then the demand starts to go up and at that point it starts to kick into gear, hence the hockey stick. So if I'm understanding you right, if someone does like basically takes all this on board but gets the where wrong, the whole thing's pretty wrong. Correct. Gotcha. Yeah. So two key words, growth nodes, transport corridors. Growth nodes are centre activities where there's going to be jobs, where there's going to be shopping centres and and activity zones, mm -hmm. uh, and then the transport corridors are how people get to and from those. Um, so one growth node and the next growth node is connected by a transport corridor. So there's always going to be density in and around all of those areas. Okay. So the first point you're really wanting to, to cover off is around highest and best use. And you and I were chatting about this a little bit off air, but I'm interested to hear how you kind of unpack this a bit more. So highest and best use is the most amount of money in the least amount of time with the least amount of effort. And so at different points in time, the most amount of money part changes. So if there's no demand for the finished product, mm -hmm. then property development won't make sense at a point in time. Okay. And so the highest and best use at that point in time is the long-term hold and an investor type approach. Um, and so later on, as the demand starts to kick in for the finished product, then that highest and best use changes. And so at that point in time, the development starts to make sense. So is this one of the differences as well between someone that just holds onto a bigger piece of land going, yeah, I'm land banking versus someone that's actually done their research to see like, is this actually a good site? Because like, I, I, I think you and I talked about this not long ago. I, there was one site I sold in particular. It was this massive triangle, sloping, horrible, everything about it was bad. But the guy that bought it was because it was like 900 square meters technically was like, yeah, and I'm land banking this for the future. And I remember thinking, no, you're not. Like this, this is really true. Like it's not going to work. Yeah, it's got to be the right product. And it, we've got to be very clear. The right product will make a lot of sense. The wrong product 
will do nothing. So this is already one of the big differences between someone that's completely passive and someone that's land banking is you might not be developing it, but you're still looking at it through a developer's eyes. Correct. The semi-passive approach, you're going to put a small amount of effort up front to make sure that you're picking the right product in the right area. Then you're going to wait. And then at some point in the future, you have many choices. You can sell it to a developer because the uplift is there. You can choose to learn the development process yourself and, and do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Or alternatively, you might own the land and you might partner or jo joint venture with a with a developer who knows what they're doing. So you don't have to do the work. You've got you options. Can, but you've got options. Yeah, but if you don't have the land or it's not a good site to begin with, that option just doesn't exist. Correct. Gotcha. Now, one of the things that I hear against this and against land banking is, well, you only made money because of the capital growth. The fact that you're developing it is by the by. Like that's, it's just, it's neither here nor there. What's your take on that? Well, again, it comes back to highest and best use. Did the deal make sense if you had have bought it at that point in time? So we wait 10 years. Mm -hmm. You've got to say, well, let's pretend that I buy it in today's market. If I pretend I buy it in today's market, would the deal make sense? If it did, then you not only had the capital growth, but you also had the development uplift. Mm -hmm. If it didn't make sense when you do that, then all you're really doing is putting a whole bunch of hassle into unlocking capital growth that you already got. Okay, so even if you don't want to develop it at the time, you essentially need to make sure you're buying a deal that is still profitably developable at the time. And that's the difference? Have I understood you right there or no, not? No, backwards. Backwards. So, so backwards. We actually want the deal to not be profitable right now. Gotcha. So okay. at that point in time, the highest and best use is just a renter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm following and, and you And so, we, so we're not really getting any uplift in the price because the developer's not interested in it. Of course, because otherwise it's going to go to someone that's looking at it going, oh, I can just see the profit in it right now. Yeah, and there's a lot of misconception that sits out there with regards to the value and what that highest and best use is and and putting that developer's uplift into it. Mm -hmm. But if the deal doesn't make sense, the developer's not going to ever buy it. So, that, so nobody's going to pay the premium. There'll be a lot of people wanting to sell it for the high price mm -hmm. and it'll sit there idle, not going anywhere. And eventually they'll come back to the market and sell it at the market price. Finally, the the cash flow of the deal. This is another common thing that I hear is it's going to stifle the growth of your portfolio because uh, and and you and I were playing around on the whiteboard before. It's like if you got a seven hundred square or eight hundred square meter block versus like let's say a five hundred fifty square meter block, they're both going to rent for again. Let's just make up numbers: five hundred dollars a week, six hundred bucks a week. But one of them you're going to be paying a substantial amount more because you're getting so much more land. But people aren't willing to go, oh, great, I've got another 200 square meters of backyard. I'm going to pay you a lot more for that when they're renting. So then the growth of your portfolio is going to take a big hit because your cash flow position isn't as good. There's a potential for that. But in a lot of those instances, because of that extra land in the backyard, you might be able to put a temporary granny flat type arrangement in there to bolster the, the rent in the short term while, mm -hmm. you, while you wait for that land banking. You put the granny flat in, in, that's relocatable, so you can put it in, sit there 10 years, take it away later on. You don't actually burn the, the intrinsic value of the granny flat, you put it on the next property. But when you start to do that, it starts to make sense when you can actually get to the point where it's developable. So a property that's 800 square metres could be anywhere from a duplex to six townhouses, for example. Mm. Now, at that point, you've gone one key to many keys. So that 550 rent that you were talking about might now be six lots of rent and those six lots of rent aren't going to be 550 because that was a second hand house these are newer houses these are newer houses yep. this might be six lots of 750 mm -hmm. so yes you might have that technical limitation of the yield at the start but you can a counteract that by doing the i guess the workaround mm -hmm. and then b later on you supercharge it when you actually get the development side in and this is what you're really talking about that is, I guess, misunderstood, not known, however we're going to describe it. But from the way you look at it, this is a potential to go like, yeah, we can grow a, a reasonable size portfolio and then just absolutely make it massive. But it has to be done right from the beginning because just getting a bigger block of land or, or getting something you can't even develop, well, then these options in 10 years' time aren't options anymore. Correct. And and I see this all the time where people go, oh, I bought the bigger block of land because I had intentions to subdivide. Or, yep. And they go, well, did you actually do all the assessments to determine if that's the case? And they go, no, it was just a big block of land. Mm. Where I see a lot of people actually make the mistake in land banking is they don't put the effort in up front to determine 
what is its long-term development potential. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a whole bunch of constraints that go into a site to determine is it going to be developable in the future. But I see a lot of people go, it's just a large block of land. I had intentions to subdivide, but I never put the effort into assessing that up front. Mm. So that the key is to understand, one, is it developable? Will council actually allow it to occur? And two, is this where the demand is going to be in the future? Is this where people are pushing, where the state government is pushing the population to go? And so I guess that's the the one difference is normally if you're talking, is it developable? The next thing you're going to say is, is it profitable? Correct. But this time it's like, no, we're not actually assessing that right now. Well, you actually still want to assess it for, is it profitable? And and you want it to be no, because you can land bank it, because then you're not competing with a developer. Gotcha. So it's the, it's the counterintuitive approach that will actually help you with a land banking. But it's all got to do with that future growth potential of knowing where the, the government's pushing the population. Yeah, and when the population gets there, then mm-hmm. the demand will be there and that will then push up the value of the development site. And at that point, sky's the limit. So just to quickly kind of round this out, Rob, can can we go through the example that you and I were chatting about before? Because that's kind of when I got a bit excited with it. Like it's... You paint the picture a little bit more of really what is possible. Well, we've got two styles of investment that are actually uh, piggybacking on top of each other. Mm -hmm. So you've got the capital growth side of things, so that you're going to get an equity uplift from the long-term capital growth. Yep. Then you've got the development potential that's actually going to kick in as well. Mm -hmm. So if we keep them as two separate ideas at the moment, what we're going to do is stack them on top of each other. Now, anyone who's been following me for a while knows that I've got a magic formula that says, how do I get a property that's owned outright? Mm -hmm. And so the magic formula is based on a a developer trying to get a 20% profit on cost. Mm -hmm. If you do six, then if you sell five, it pays down the cost and the the six one's owned free and clear. That is one that we're going to open up on a whole other episode, which I'm looking forward to actually getting into all the details about that. So that's the development at the tail. Mm -hmm. So... The development's going to give us one for free. Mm -hmm. The capital uplift also potentially might mean that there's a second one for free if you're able to get, uh, if you were able to get the six onto that particular property. Mm -hmm. So now, depending upon how long we've held it, um, it could be anywhere from five to 15 years that you might need to hold it for that demand to come into the area. But now you've got two properties that are actually owned outright. You don't have to sell anything down other than the stock that you've created, you know, to pay off the, the, the development debt. Um, but you're going to own those properties outright, outright and there's passive income forever then. Biggest thing I like about this is that if you're a bit more risk averse and you, but you want to still do a bit of a value add, but maybe DIY or even just managing a renovation doesn't appeal to you. It's like, here's a way that you can almost like push forward the value add potential by still doing the research up front, selecting your property right up front. You, you're kind of getting into it, but not completely but you're still going to see a potential wonderful uplift later on. And multiple exit strategies. Sell it to a developer, get an uplift because of the demand at the time. Mm-hmm. Partner with the developer and and, and you do nothing. Uh, they use the equity uplift that you've got to tap into that in order to get the development potential and they share the profits with you. Mm-hmm. Or alternatively, you've got a long time to learn the development process and you can actually do this yourself. Yeah, you, you would have a while, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> you've got a while. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, Rob Flux from the Property Developer Network. As always, mate, thank you for coming on the show. My, my pleasure.